because I just really didn't recognize myself and I cried every day. She was so open in this episode about the struggles she's faced being a founder and being a mother and also her really tough experiences during pregnancy. You pitching seven days after birth. I can't even imagine. I worked all day, all night. We've got a, like an investor call. And they're like, oh, how old is he? I'm He's like, a week old now. They're like, oh, that's cute. Okay, so let's get into it. It's a myth that you can have it all. I just don't think you can have it all, all of the time. You don't always do the school run, but then you feel guilty that you're not doing the school run and they finish school in the middle of the day. We expect women to be at home as if they don't have a job and expect people to be at their job as if they don't have children. My learnings are that I couldn't really get the help in the time that I needed it. It was really hard. It was really hard. Do you mind talking about what made it so tough? Lots to do. I've just been planning out my day. However, with Revolut as my main account, I've got one less thing to worry about, money. I know my money's safe with Revolut, so I can focus on other important matters like planning a wedding. That is why I pay with Revolut. If Revolut detects anything suspicious with your transfer, you'll receive an in-app warning straight away. And how cool is this? You create a single use card in the app with just one tap. And then after the purchase is made, your details disappear immediately. So they cannot be reused. Now, if you happen to lose or misplace your card, which is never a fun time for anyone, but a surprisingly regular occurrence for me, you can freeze your card instantly through the Revolut app. And if there's anything I do need help with, Revolut's customer service team are on hand 24 seven via the in-app chat. It is a huge reassurance for me and just one of the many reasons why Revolut is the main account for all of my finances. But don't just take my word for it, over 35 million people around the world trust Revolut with their money. Join us and create your account today. What is up and welcome to this episode of Working Hard, Hardly Working. Today, I am so excited to be talking to Laura Jackson. Laura's professional biography is honestly one of the most extensive I have ever read. She is a prime example of how to ace a non-linear career path by saying yes to opportunities that feel right. From hosting Take Me Out the Gossip to writing cookbooks and now founding Glassette, which is kind of known as the net -a porter for homeware, which had a Christmas pop-up in Selfridges. Laura is the ultimate plate juggler and that's without adding her three kids and a recent funding round into the equation. I'm such a fan of the business she's built at Glassette and she was so open in this episode about the struggles she's faced along the way not just with the realities of being a founder but also with being a founder and being a mother and also her really tough experiences during pregnancy and I felt like that was just such an incredibly honest and open conversation um, and you could tell how from the heart it was. And I feel like these conversations are so important to have and how much everything you see online is really kind of, I mean, we all talk about it being highlight reel, it's such a cliche, but it really, really is, especially when it comes to looking at people who are definitely kind of by definition doing it all. I just thought it was a really important conversation to have and I cannot thank Laura enough for being so open about it. If you did like this episode, please make sure to like and subscribe. It hugely helps the podcast. Please make sure to let us know which types of guests you like, what you wanna hear more of, what you wanna hear less of, but only if you're nice and polite. And as always, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, it helps us to make the podcast better and better and just have conversations that you wanna hear. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited <laughs> to have you here. We've already had a little bit of a teaser of a conversation. Um, and I just want to get straight into, right at the beginning, mm -hmm. your early life, your childhood. What were you like as a child? I can't, I feel like when everyone, anyone ever asked this, I can't ever really remember because mm. it was just really, um, it was chaotic. I was one of five in a split family and there was always lots going on. Um, my mum was brilliant in terms of like always having an activity for us to do. Mm. So yeah, it was it was it was a busy start. And um, did you always have big dreams? Like, did you always think I want to be on TV? Did you? What was like? What were your aspirations? I loved telly as a kid. Like, I mm. love telly. I love telly now. I love how it makes me feel. I love the escapism. I'm dyslexic, so reading was never something that I enjoyed because I found it quite difficult. Right. Um, I loved imagining things when I did read books, but I got so much out of telly um, that I kind of, but I didn't really understand 
that there were jobs in telly, if that makes sense. Right. Like I knew there was actors and I knew that there was presenters, but I didn't really understand the mechanics of, you know, like there's people working in on like the production and the logistics. And I, I didn't really know about that um, because I couldn't see it and I didn't really know anyone that did that. So I always knew that I'd love telly. And when I've spoke to people from school, they were like, you always wanted to do big things. You always want to go somewhere and do something. And so I guess I did, but I don't think I knew it or I knew how to articulate it until mm. I've had children of my own and I, I look back at that time. But yeah, I, I, I like dreaming big. It's, 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 a good, it's a good place for me. And how did that original dreaming big end up with you like getting your first jobs on TV like talk to me about the beginning of your career and how it even took off well I've always had a job right because I'm one of five so my mum always said if I'm giving you a fiver I've lost 25 quid I've got to give everyone a fiver <laughs> so, so true so I've ha always had a job whether it was mm. delivering leaflets babysitting washing up in a pub like I've always worked right I've had this hard work instilled in me from a very young age even make your bed to tidy your room my mum's like I'm not making five beds you can all make your own yeah, beds, yeah. which is, <laughs> I was like, that's really harsh. But now I'm like, absolutely. Oh my God, there is no way that will not be my, like, yeah. <laughs> that is going to be the full ethos. My mum's always done things in a, she's an outsourcer. Like we all had, it was all delegated from like day one, including her ones. Mm. So rather than like, I'm going to make five beds, it was okay. We're here. If you want to watch TV and like want to have dinner, you've got to get all of the beds like all of yeah. the rooms ready for bed including things like unfolding her like we the turn down service <laughs> like we would literally like go upstairs and like turn on the she had this little electric blanket <laughs> delegated from day one it's very good tactic yeah, yeah. i like Rules it 101 about yeah. running a team <laughs> she was like i have given birth to a team of people yeah yeah you've got to look at it that, that way i mean she did I, <laughs> I say to my daughter now teamwork is and she goes dream work and i'm like what is wrong with me <laughs> <laughs> but um it's true it's like it, it's yeah it's a it's a good lesson to instill early on for sure what the question was no that's fine so have I oh talking about the how you originally like first got into oh. TV oh yes yeah, so I've always had a job um and I think um my like um my circumstances changed and we moved from Huddersfield to Leeds and um and then I uh, my mum ended up getting sick and I studied um instead of moving away to go to university I decided to study events management at um, Leeds Polytechnic and um, I think at the time I I just didn't really know what I wanted to do so spending four years studying parties seemed like a great idea yeah and um, then I moved to London um, out of my home with my mum and moved to London on my own so then I kind of I'd, I'd always work, but I had to really survive then. I, I could have a bit of pocket money and I didn't need to worry about it because I was living at home. But then I was like self-sufficient, right? I, I had to pay my own way for everything. And um, uh, my parents have been like lovely and support me, but you know, I, I needed to get a job. So when I moved to um, London, I transferred my course um, for university. Then I kind of started like working, working, right? And um, I'd do anything for money in terms of I wasn't fussy about the job I had a job as a cleaner I was like desperate for money so I flyered around all the houses near where I lived and just said I would do anything like maintenance cleaning and I um, cleaned a lady's house I um, did like PR jobs where I like dressed up as a gin bottle handing out leaflets at the train station you know all of the things yeah um, and I've very early on I knew I never wanted to have a nine-to-five the thought of a desk with a picture of my family on for me never felt like it 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 was my mm -hmm. thing. So I liked the kind of the randomness of all of these jobs together. And I think actually that's kind of informed how I've gone on as a person, like at the heart of it, the foundation is like community and making people feel good, but there's lots of different like avenues and paths that come with that. Sorry if I feel like I've gone off on one. No. But, um, so then I got a job working at Shoreditch House it just opened and I was like this is great I can work for 5 p.m until it closed at like 3 a.m I wasn't spending money and I was saving money I really wanted to go to South America and I met somebody there and I was like I really want to work in telly and they were like why and I was like because I love telly and um really <laughs> bad I watch tv because I watch telly obviously um not very good at acting I kind of wanted to yeah I wanted to be a host and that's kind of how it started I got introduced to an agent um, they sent me for an audition. I got the audition and then they 
managed that job for me and it kind of just went from there. Um, but very, very slowly, I think it's been brick by brick. Um, that I feel like for me, it's always been about kind of learning. Mm. And what is life as a TV presenter like? It's really tough. It's really tough because I suppose it's a job where you're really putting your personality out there and that's mm. like, that is authentically you. Um, and I think that, um, I think from like the inception of me kind of going into that broadcast world, I always wanted to do other things around it. And I think that it, for me, I, I always like things that make, make me a more well-rounded person and try and challenge myself. So as I was doing broadcast and I was thinking about ideas and having meetings and it felt very much that my um, future was potentially in the hands of other people because I was asking them for a job. And I've always done that from a very young age. That's all I've ever known, right? So having having a situation where I was meeting people and asking them for a job or like, am I good enough? It didn't feel very me. So I'm like, right, what can I do that kind of takes control and creates an opportunity for myself? Yes, I can write pitch decks. Yes, I can pitch ideas. Yes, I can think about all of that kind of broadcast work. Mm. But what can I do that's ownable, that's mine? So me and a friend started a supper club and this was, oh God, I can't remember how long ago, over 10 years ago, I can't remember. Um, but um, we didn't invent the supper club, but we were very ad early adapters in a movement that was inviting strangers around for dinner and creating an experience. I love experiences. I love making people feel a certain way, which is why I love telly. And um, that making people feel a certain way, whether it's broadcast or food was really important to me. We started the supper club and then that kind of took off. We got a cookbook, we designed a, two ranges for habitat and then this whole lifestyle food entertaining thing came out of me. But it was always in me because I was always the waitress at, uh, uh, I was always, always waitress, but I was always the waitress at home when I was, you know, helping my mum, like if friends were coming over for dinner or whatever. So being one thing, 15 years ago was all people wanted, right? They just, they wanted to put you in a box and they wanted you to be a TV presenter or a businesswoman or whatever it was. And I never felt like that. I never felt like I was one thing. And I think that it's now really accept, as you know, right? You know, you do multiple things and it's very accepted now. Mm. But I felt like when I started, people were like, oh, sorry, what do you do? You're mm. a broadcaster, but you do a supper club. Oh, that's. Ooh, yeah, it was very much, it's like the gig economy has like gone from being, th th there was an unglamorousness to it in the yeah. way that like the assumption was that you couldn't make money from just one thing. Yeah. Therefore you, and you weren't good enough at it. And therefore you had to like plug it with yeah. all of these other things around versus like the desirability of now of like a multi-hyphenate career of like, yeah. oh, I'm this and this and this. Yeah. And it's a really interesting shift. Yeah. Like I think about a lot how, that's changed so quickly. Yeah. And I think the, I think it, because it used to be desirable or as a sign of like moving up, like mm. in terms of like, you know, the way society was seen in terms of work, it used to be seen as desirable to have one thing and be able to maintain that one thing for yeah. like 30, 40 years yeah. in terms of like a career. And that switch now, in terms of like you have more freedom if you're able to decide what that looks like mm. is a really interesting mm. change. Well, I think it was always acceptable for men to do multiple things, but right. for women it wasn't. And I think I was met with questions, I would say, in terms of what do you do and what do you want to do? But for me, it always felt comfortable to do multiple mm. things because I felt like they were complementary to each other you know, meeting people at a supper club and introducing people and creating a network and a community actually was empowering and important for my broadcast work. Mm. So it all kind of works together, I think. And how did you find energy outside of like trying to make it in the TV industry to also be trying these other things like supper clubs? I think it's so interesting because I think that like now we have so much pressure to like monetize every hobby oh, yeah. because they're like it's been democratized mm. in like, you can't monetize everything, like literally everything, everything is content and everything is mon monetizable. So there's this, like, why would you do a supper club if it wasn't 
like it has to be something then that makes money and I think that's really interesting in our like shift in perception of like how we spend our time I don't think like that though but 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 I I agree that's yeah. the right way to think as in I agree that we shouldn't all think like that but yeah. I do think there's been like a societal shift in moving from that way to another yeah was it just like a are you one of those types of people that has like boundless energy in terms of like you spend a day doing an audition and like trying to get something and then you gain more energy by doing something like a supper club is that kind of what you're like I've got so much energy and I'm a very creative person and as I say like I'm opportunistic right so mm. if I go on holiday and I eat an amazing taco I'm like oh my god I want to invite all of my friends over and make these tacos for them right and but the the yeah everything has become quite transactional which mm. is quite sad yeah but actually that's what you decide to do with that right because I know I have I know for me it's important that yes if I'm doing something for a job for a brand it's very much about um um like making sure they get the content and they get exactly mm. what they need right it's a job but it's about how you're making people feel and that's not transactional I, I see you know I go to events where it's so noticeable that there's a great group of people who are really present, who want to talk to you, who want to engage, who want to build relationships, who are in that moment. Yes, we take a picture, but it's actually like what you get from that is so much more than making it transactional and monetizing mm. because that's you as a person. And that's really like Instagram could be gone tomorrow. TikTok shop could be gone tomorrow. Like what's left if that all goes, you want to make sure that you've got relationships and I don't know that you're happy with yourself and you're 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 a good person not because it's you've been paid to be right yeah of course and I do think that there's like an element of it that like demonizes the individual for mm. like making decisions to monetize more yeah whereas like we have been presented like almost a society now where if you're not taking those opportunities, then you're leaving money on the table and therefore whatever situation you're in, it could mm. be better. And therefore it is only your fault if you're not like, that's kind of what the mm. economy now says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just such a tricky world to navigate. That mm. is for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think just always being authentic and true to yourself and doing the things that for me I'm like can I go to bed at night knowing that I've made the right decision for me and my family mm. it's you know I, I I say I'm sure you're the same saying no to opportunities where you don't think that if somebody offered you a lot of money to do something that you didn't believe in you wouldn't do it because you yeah, don't believe in it and I think that I think yeah it's it, it, it's, it's so it is just so tricky now yeah it's so tricky that's exactly what I mean like I mean that it's very it feels hard to navigate. Like it feels yeah. like you're always making the wrong decision, whether it's the wrong decision <laughs> for like an opportunity yeah. or whether it's the wrong decision for like your livelihood. Like what's your, what's the, at that stage in your career when you were obviously starting out and kind of trying a lot of different things and going for a lot of different jobs, what was the wildest TV job that you've had? I did a really lovely show called World's Most Talented where I traveled around the world for UK TV doing this talent show. That was amazing. Amazing. I met the most interesting people who invited me into their homes and cooked me dinner and looked after me. We went to this um, Romanian family's house and we'd met their daughter who was a gymnast and she was a contortionist and she could basically fold herself up into the size of a crisp packet. They were so kind. They invited us to their house. We had dinner. They gave us this homemade vodka. They had like these beautiful lace tablecloths and walls just kind of full of family pictures and heirlooms. And I was like, this, I'm so lucky. This is so culturally enriching. And they didn't have a lot, but they gave us everything. And it was just such a, it was such a lovely, warm experience. And we didn't capture that. We've gone to kind of mm. her school to, to see her gymnastics. Um, but just that side of it was, was just amazing. That connection that we had with them, it was really great. I really loved that. Yeah. And did you like having these incredible experiences and like being able to experience so many different things through one job, I mm. think is like unbelievable. Yeah. Did you think that you wanted to be in TV forever? Like when did you start making the decision to, you know, concentrate on things like design and, and founding a company and kind mm. of making that move? Well, I, I started my supper club not really long after I'd been in broadcast. So mm. 
I think from very early on, I wasn't like, this is the one thing that I want to do. Right. It was kind of always a collection of things because I like, I like to be inspired and I like to inspire and I really like to be creative. So it all kind of fed into each other. I think when I, I think having children um, and maybe that kind of having more ownership over my career then perhaps presented more kind of like the segments of my career as it were but it's all they've always kind of they've always kind of been the same thing I think I've just re like kind of defined what they are as I've grown older and wiser hopefully and I've still got I'm still so young I've still got so much to learn, but I think I'm just learning more about myself, right? And my niche and what I want to do. And I think that kind of lifestyle living, my kind of philosophy is a life well lived. I like mm. to think, do things beautifully and I like to do things well. Um, I don't like to do something with 10%. I want to choose the projects that I want to spend my time and I can be present with people and give 100% to and making sure they look lovely and they're there to last mm. rather than maybe when I first started I was like splattergun like I'll just do everything and see what right. sticks I'm very I'm very I know exactly what I want to do now and where did the original idea for Glassette come from a couple of things one was that I love homeware I love looking at things and I love having this emotional connection to a mug a glass I collect yeah, things sorry we didn't give you a nice one no it's nice I have no emotional connection there. <laughs> um but I've always collected things from wherever I've gone and I love them being like a talking point like oh I got it there and I've, I've, mm. I've bought it from this lady and she made it all these things so I kind of wanted to create that feeling but online I, there wasn't a marketplace doing homeware in the way that we were doing it we were uh, I, I think kind of yeah we wanted to be the the first um place that thought about content and community as well as product mm. so that was one reason um another reason was I was buying lots of home when I felt it was really fragmented and I had like 10 tabs going like oh what's that what's that oh would they look nice together so I kind of wanted to create one place for it all and another reason was that I had my son and um at the time I was doing supper clubs um under um host and I got a legal letter from somebody telling me that they wanted me to take down my Instagram and to stop doing my supper clubs um and um, I was really upset because I, I I was like I built this out of community um I built this because I love people and I love bringing people together mm. I'm a really good connector anyone will say if you ever want to meet someone or get connected or know so like ask Laura she'll couldn't get you she'll send you the email for the table that you want to get booked or whatever like I just love people it's really important to me and I, I was so like wow why would someone do this why wouldn't someone try and get my telephone number and and call me and was it like a like a trademark type violation thing um, or like a yeah, kind of, kind of a you're stepping on my toes sort of thing. And, right. and I was like, oh, I really, I'm, I'm, I yeah. don't understand the, I don't understand that. We can all have supper. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, but it was, I was doing food. So. Right. But also, yeah, like there's so much space. There's so much space. And for me, I'm like, make friends, let's do things together. Right. But and I was really, I was really, really upset. I just had a baby and I was like, but all I want to do is for people to be friends and to create community and someone's trying to like take me down basically. Also I'm like, what do I do with a legal letter? I'm quite no sure, idea. like logistically, where do we go from here? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Google, I've just had this letter and I don't, there's no way in that space that I don't even understand. So, I, I, and I was really like, oh, okay, well, what, and then, I, and then it kind of flipped in a way. And I was like, well, what can I do to empower as many people as possible? Mm. What can I create where I feel like I can make people never feel like this? I want to create a big community, right? Let's start in the UK, but let's build it out as a, a big community where people feel welcome, where people feel accepted, where people can share ideas and opinions. And that was another reason why I wanted to build Glasset. So they were like the three key Three very good reasons. Yeah, three pillars. And did it start as a kind of side hustle type thing? Did you think it was going to become a kind of full blown business as it is? I wanted it to be a big business from right from the very beginning. Mm. I know that it will be, and um, I'm so passionate about it. Um, for me, 
success comes from passion. Success is so subjective. It means different things to different people. But for me, it was about creating a community where I could help them with a life well lived. That's like my saying for everything, life well lived. And so I wanted to create a life well lived for lots of different people and for two customers, right? The brands and the people that were buying mm. from us. So yeah, I, 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 I want it to be a really big business. And how did you even get it started? Like I really don't know now. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know. But people ask me, I'm like, I, I just must have been a crazy person because I worked all day, all night. Like I was getting up at like 4.30 a.m. and working until the baby got, I, I was like, just worked and worked and worked. Mm. I had a really good network of people because um, I was writing for Elle Decoration and I love interiors and I love chatting to people. So I just got loads of brands and said, this is what I wanna do. I've not got a deck yet, but I promise it's gonna be great. And they were like, well, we know whatever you will do, you'll do it with love and passion and care and honesty. And I was like, okay, this is great. And that kind of gave me a bit of a like, Ooh, yeah, okay. So we're really doing this, right? Yeah. Um, and I went to my brother-in-law who um, worked with John and Christian at End and he was a buyer, um, he was a buyer there and he really understands product. And I said, I've got this idea that it's kind of like a not on the high street meets a cherish, meets a kind of um, Food 52. It's empowered by community and content and product. And he was like, I would love to do this with you. So. Um, we did that together and we just, yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know. We just worked and grafted and I don't know a single thing about business. I studied events management university. I, I basically just, I look for the light and I work hard. Mm. And just keep on pushing. Keep going. The next thing. Keep going. I think that's so valuable because I also think that it's like, it's so intimidating yeah, and it's it so is. easy to think like, there's so many steps to get there. And it's like, yeah, there are so many steps to get yeah. there, but there's one right in front of you. And then there's one tomorrow and then there's yeah. one the day after and you can maybe make two one day yeah. if you like really push. And it is just like, I've had so many people on this podcast who've literally said like, I walked down the street and I went into a shop and I asked them this and like, that's how yeah. I got my answer and that's how I found this person. And it really is, it's just about movement. Like yeah. it's just about like pushing and trying the next thing, throwing a few things at the wall. Yeah. A few of them don't stick, but one of them does. Yeah. And like that kind of perseverance, not needing to know it all. I feel like there's so much it's so easy to get terrified by the fact that there are all of these steps and the fact that you don't know everything. Mm, yeah, totally. And it's really important not to know everything or not yeah. to think that you know everything because you you, you don't. Like it, it's, it's so important to be open and vulnerable to learn. Like mm. curiosity is so important. And um, we can't all, like we can't always, um, we don't always have as as much time as we would like, but right. kind of trying using our, our time as effectively as possible, um, which I'm sure that you agree, it's like so hard to, to yeah. balance everything. But um, yeah, I think having integrity and just hard work, it is hard work. And I, you know, I, you know this kind of like whole like live, work, balance, juggle thing. It's, I really like, to, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out in my head at the mm. moment because I really like working. It's not horrendous as in, I really enjoy the work that I do and I feel so lucky that I do. Some days are much harder than others, but um, I think having having like, having like that passion is important. Mm, no, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, in a world where we do have to work, like pretty much all of us have to work, yeah. creating something that whether it's the job itself or whether it's the people you work with or whether it's the type of work you do, like physically problem solving or whatever it might be. I do think there's a lot to be said for like, in the world where we all have to work for the ability to create something about what you're doing that you enjoy, whether that is like the overall job itself or whether it's like, it doesn't need to be that you feel like there's a for a lot of people, it will be that there's like a great purpose and that is a huge privilege and that is, you know, a great mm. place to be. But also even just like the people you work with or the way you work or the problem solving you're doing or like the ability to go there every day and come home and like be paid for having to interact, for having interacted with like interesting people. Yeah. I think it's such a, I mean, there's so much to be said for it and it's such a privilege to be able to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Massively. Obviously, homeware retail is famously quite saturated. Like mm -hmm. there are lots of brands that have been and gone. There are lots mm -hmm. of brands in the space. There's lots of noise in the space. Yeah. Why do you feel like Glasset struck a chord and was able to kind of cut through that noise? Well, I mean, 
we are we're a tech business. We are a platform. We sell product, but we don't own anything. So it's right. very di- it's quite different in okay. the way that it's set up. But what we do is we curate. So our USP is curation and the brands that we have on, and the meaning behind those brands and how we can communicate those brands with our customers. And I think it's contextualizing everything and giving giving product meaning. It's, it's not about just sell, 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 sell. It's about why do we, we don't need more things. Mm. But it's about creating this life well lived. It's about the emotional connections for things, right? It's it's about making people feel good. It's about adding joy to people's lives. I get joy from glassware and curtains and wallpaper and turns out lots of other people do too. Yeah. So I think that that's why we've struck a chord and we're accessible and we have a great tone of voice and we we really love our customers. Um, we are still kind of, you know, early stages. We've just had our second birthday just, and we're still very much learning. I mean, we have got such big, exciting ideas and I'm sure like Tali, you know, lots of people come to you with lots of ideas and collaborations and partnerships. So it's just figuring out, I, I, it's, it's consumerism, but, I want it to be thoughtful. That's really important. Mm. So it is brick by brick. It's step by step. It's building a business that's going to last. And every decision is really important. Every decision is really thought about. Um, And maybe people, that resonates with people. Maybe people can, I don't know, there's like an undertone that people get from the way that we talk about things. We talk about product, the way that we do our editorial, the way that we talk talk to our customers. Mm. It kind of, it's important, right? It's, you're building a brand. As you know, you're not just selling products. I think that that's the difference. It's about discovery. It's about inspiration. It's about looking at things that make you feel good. And you don't have to buy first time, but you'll come back because you know that's a space that makes you feel good. And that's Mm. really important to me. Again, how does it make people feel? So important. And we've got such amazing ideas. Oh my God, I just wish I could tell you like what we're doing next because it's just so great. And... I think I'm such an ideas person that I, I I just, yeah, it's it's really exciting. And I think that that kind of energy um, hopefully comes through with the business and through our kind of socials and our newsletters and our editorial. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about the business. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole thing having a business and being a founder, but it's something that I really, I really love it. And how was, you raised 1.2 million in funding. Yeah, so we've raised we raised 1.2 first round, and we've just we're we've just we're doing like a rolling close with this next round, which has been really hard. It's not the right landscape, as in like in terms of like mm-hmm. the funding landscape at the moment is crazy. Mm. Like it is the most insane. I've heard every single founder talking about like how unbelievably tough it is at the moment. Mm. What's the what's the aim with this next fundraise? Um, it is too, well, I can't totally tell you because it would be giving our kind of, um, strategy away. Um, but it's to just supercharge the business Mm. to get more people knowing shopping. Um, yeah. And let us talk about you. You've spoken openly before around, you know, being a mother and being a founder and kind of how obviously you founded Glasset after you know you kind of already had children Mm. but how have you found that journey I can imagine there were uh, certain things that are more flexible because it's your business but also certain things that Mm. the business doesn't wait when it needs to you know have some issues yeah um how have you found that I I find um juggling and balance um something that I'm trying to get to grips with I guess um, I, my baby is not eight, nine months. I should know. Um, and having a business, being a founder is tough and I, but I, I don't do it on my own. And I think sometimes the misconception is when you see people's, you know, the daily situations on Instagram, you might think, oh, it's this or it's that, but it's, um, yeah, it's it, it it's it's chaotic, but I I really like I thrive in chaos, but I can't do everything as as you as you know you can't mm. do everything all of the time, and I think it's a myth that you can have it all. I just don't think you can have it all all of the time. I feel yeah. like I'm going in a very roundabout way of saying that 
Um, I'm just figuring out, I'm figuring it out right mm. now. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a co-founder who is in the business every single day. I think about the business every minute of, of, of every day, every second. I have a notepad by my bed and I usually wake up in the night and write down notes. Or if I see something, I've got you know files of, on my phone and on my computer for inspiration and whatever. So it's always in my head. But the other things that I do feed into the business, so I have to make sure that I have time for everything. Um, I just have to be disciplined, I think. But yeah, I'm figuring, I'm trying to figure it out. And what have been your biggest learnings recently in terms of that kind of figuring it out? Like the best way to, I mean, I completely agree. You can have it all, but you can't have it all at once. Like yeah. you've got to, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to be give and take. Yeah, I think, I think my learnings coming into a new year are that I want to be more thoughtful about the decisions that I make and I don't have to do everything all of the time. Usually right. I'll write like a 12 month plan, but actually this year my plan is 18 to 24 months. My plan is to take, to be slower about things. It's not about um, shouting the loudest. It's not about um, like launching in 10 brands a day. Right. Like people, I, I want to be more thoughtful. I want to be slower. I want to build brick by brick. So I've got something that lasts in every sphere of my life. Mm. And that kind of hopefully will free more time. So when I do do the school run, which I don't, by the way, I have help with the children. Right. Because uh can't do everything all of the time and they finish school in the middle of the day. I know. What is that about? <laughs> because actually that's one of the things that has been, is the biggest shock coming into adulthood. You remember that children finish school at three. Yeah, 3.30, 3.30, yeah. What is nine, that about? Nine till three thirty. How does anyone deal with that? I know with it's kids? really hard, and and people, it's 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 perhaps tricky because we don't, as women, always want to be like, oh, we don't want to talk about these things, but then we don't. We're like, why aren't we talking about these things? It's, right. Again, it's trying to figure out the balance, and kind of taking down the mask of the, well, you, you do have someone that helps you with yeah. childcare. You have to. Or you don't always do the school run, but then you feel guilty that you're not doing the school run or you're on the school run sending a quick email or, you know. But the school run is after you need to be on the way to work. And finishing yeah. school is before you need to be coming home from work. Yeah. Like, I truly don't know how anyone does it. And I, like, I, one of my, like, most formative experiences was the fact that, like, I've always had a mum who, like, works very, very hard, has always been very, like, career driven. Mm. And... I remember I used to be so jealous of all of the people who like saw their parents in the evenings. Mm -hmm. And I, first of all, I think it was the best thing that it it's taught me so much. Mm -hmm. So like anytime I'm speaking to people who I remember I had someone on the podcast who's a female founder and she was like, are you like, are they gonna hate me forever? And I was like, it's the best thing that like ever <laughs> happened to me. Yeah. And I just, but I do think that like, how on earth else would it work? Like it's so, I don't know, we have such poor provisions for mm -hmm. women in work. Mm -hmm. And then we have such high expectations and we expect women to be at home as if they don't have a job and expect people to be at their job as if they don't have mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And we ask women in interviews whether they have children or whether they're thinking about having children exactly because we don't think we have enough things in place to make them still be able to do their job properly. Mm. And it's like, that's so loaded yeah. and tough yeah. and like when you think about it we really only are like 70 years into it being acceptable for any woman to have jobs anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a people pleaser to my detriment and I think that I just always want to do the best for everybody I want to pick up my daughter from school and be really present but then I also really want to be in that meeting and learn about what's going on and you know but you just can't be in all of the places all of the time so I think just I don't know I don't know if you ever don't feel guilty I'm not sure um or I don't know if you just make peace with the fact that you feel guilty and that's just how you feel mm. um so probably that and have you felt that more as you've had more children or the other way around well I don't know because I just fired them all out sure so, this, so I mean very I've got productive very productive three I have three under four so I just well four and under so I just I just um yeah, I knew I wanted three children. In a way, I feel like I'm taking everything that I've learned and everything that I've created so far, and now I'm kind of going into this year knowing that 
um, I'm not, it sounds awful that I'm not, but like, it's such a privilege to be pregnant. Like, I find talking about this really difficult because I'm very torn because it's a miracle. It is a miracle. And it was also not everybody's choice. Not everybody wants to have children. So I feel very, very, I'm grateful and I'm lucky. But I feel like maybe now I have a bit more headspace going into this year thinking, right, like, I don't have to worry about sneezing and weeing all the time. Or well, actually, mm. that's a lie I do. Um, but going into kind <laughs> but of... it's nice to see a horizon while that might not be the case. <laughs> do my pelvic floors now, can you tell? <laughs> um, but going into it thinking more kind of work rather than yeah. working it around being pregnant. and. But also just because it's a privilege to have been pregnant and to have children, it doesn't negate your experience. No, and it no. doesn't like you, and I know you've spoke openly about this before and mm. you know how challenging mm. your third pregnancy was. Yeah. And that will have been so valuable to so many people to hear. And like, there is, we talk about mum guilt. You've talked about mum guilt at work. There's mum guilt around pregnancy. There's yeah. mom, like, you're carrying so much and so much expectation to also love it and be excited mm. at every time and mm. to feel grateful. And like, you can be inherently grateful and hold gratitude and still have had a really fucking tough pregnancy yeah 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 absolutely I think um yeah I really it was not it was not a fun time for sure and what do you mind talking about what made it so tough well I don't I, it's, I can't really pinpoint it's not like a I think I don't think you can pinpoint one thing I think it's just you don't do anything your body's doing it and you can you imagine how hard your body is working without you doing anything and you don't really understand what's going on because sometimes you can have a good pregnancy, sometimes you can have a bad pregnancy. And I think I'd had a good one, an okay one, and then a really bad one. Mm. And every day was just a struggle. Every day, I feel I can't talk about it. it makes me sad. <laughs> it was really hard. It was really hard. I think. Um, I think I'm, so, I'm. I think I'm. So somewhat of a like, it's fine. But I think mm. it was just, it was a real struggle because I just really didn't recognize myself and I cried every day. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite an optimist. So yeah. to, feel, to feel like reduced to not really understanding why I felt a certain way was quite difficult. And it's really hard on the NHS because there's so, there's so many people that need help. So when they, they do refer you, because they're like, well, because um, postnatal depression is spoken about so often, mm. but antenatal depression isn't really spoken a lot. And you can't, um, you've got a bit of, like you've got, you're on the timeline, right? Mm. You've got the date when the baby's coming in and around. Um, and yeah, I just, I couldn't really get, I couldn't really get the help and the time that I needed it. So I was like, just trying to do things to, I don't know, I guess make myself feel better. But then the baby came and it, it was so much, I, I felt like a weight had lifted off me. It's hard, isn't it? I, 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 I've never felt that low before. So I, I, I right. kind of, and it came out of nowhere really. So I don't know, just trying to manage it, I guess. Yeah, no, but I can't even imagine like the, cause one of the things we obviously have to carry as women and we can say all of this with an underlying, like it is a huge privilege to have children and to get pregnant mm. and all of these things. Mm. Which is why I but, find it hard talking about of it. Of course, but like at the same time, your experience is so real and it's so important. And there will be so many people who actually, just as you've said, like feeling confused and not mm. knowing where it's come from and not knowing yeah. how to fix it. Like there will be so many people that feel that way. And we've, for so long, we've, first of all, we use gratitude as like a weapon with which to like, kind of smack women back into place in terms of those things, mm. even between us. Yeah. Like it, there is this expectation that we should be carrying it so gratefully that actually, you know, why complain? But also yeah. it's not about complaining. It's about the fact that you had a really tough experience. Mm. And just because it was something to do with nature, it doesn't mean that it's any less important than if you had a tough experience going through grief or going mm. through like a really terrible time at work or just depression as a whole like yeah. all of that must have been so much for your body mm. at the same time as you also don't know what's happening next and you're also carrying all of this expectation that you need to be as healthy as possible mm. so that there's nothing wrong with your child as well yeah. like that is I can't even imagine how much that would have been to carry mm. and to make it through each day whilst also still feeling happy and grateful and posit like positive about the future. Like, yeah. 
Like, where does it stop? And then going, having the baby and then going straight into a fundraise for seven months and being like, oh, okay, hey. I I can't Mm -hmm. even imagine. You know, it was the worst thing. It's like, oh, we've got like an investor call. And then, and then they're like, oh, you had your baby. I'm like, yeah, oh, here's the baby. Oh, no. oh how old is he? I'm like, oh, I think he's um, uh, seven, seven a week. he's a week old now. They're like, oh, that's cute. Okay, so let's get into it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. And I kind of, it didn't feel as challenging as the pregnancy because the pregnancy was not enjoyable. And I really felt a bit like, I, well, yeah, as, I, as you just saw, like it was just hard. Mm. So going into that, I was like, oh, well, it doesn't feel as, at least I feel like I've got a bit of my brain back, but that was, I mean. I mean, that is a comedy sketch. Like that is literally like a skit, but like you pitching seven days after. It's like this, like this on my, on my, so then no one could see like anything from below my face. I think, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I just, the work, like, again, it's how do you talk about, sometimes I'm like, how do you talk about fundraising as well on, on a platform or a podcast or a, your Instagram, like really like the, sometimes it's conversations that are kind of safe with your friends where you can just be like, Mm, no, I know because you've got an audience and you've got maybe the audience of the fun, like the fun. So you've got like, you know, it's also a niche conversation and like all of these different things. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like your reality. And it is like, when you listen to that as a human, and like what you went through and what you've been going through. When you listen to that as a human, take away any expectation of like, oh, but they should be grateful about this and you should be grateful that you have a business mm-hmm. and you should be like all of these different things. When you listen to that as a human, it you like you see how tough that was. Yeah. You see how like what you had to go through and all of these things. And mm-hmm. so like there is a lot of validity to that as an like as an experience and something that is crazy. Like it is crazy that you were on funding calls seven days after mm-hmm. like birth and that you felt like that was better as well but like that was easier than the previous seven days or like yeah. than seven days before that like yeah. you're incredible and to have done that and to like I don't know I just can't even imagine yeah but I I, I, I do believe in kind of like in adversity you can thrive because mm. again you find the opportunities and actually um there's some kind of avenues that we could have gone down where we could have raised a considerable amount of money from a fund but actually the ideas that we've had now for the business would not be there Mm. so I think that I always look for the positive I always try and look for the light and I think that it's been I always like I keep saying this to people I'm like oh my god shut up but 2023 was like a year of growth and learning I learned so much about myself I learned so much about what is important I learned so much about the business so much about how to run a business and, and you know I get decision paralysis sometimes because so many people have an opinion on things and it's just taught me how to deal with that um and you know I, it, you, you're creative I'm we in terms of food at home right just uh I'm really frugal like I open the fridge and there's like four things in there and John's like oh my god there's nothing to eat and I'm like Yes, there is. <laughs> I'll make something. It's like, how have you made? I mean, it's not great, but how have you made this out of like, like, a, like a really sad, very sad carrot? Right. And I feel like that about life. I'm like, well, okay, it's really hard, and w- with the funding journey, and we've 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 spoken to this person, that person, we've emailed how many how many people who've not got back to us. We've 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 had so many no's, so many doors slam in our face. But then it's like you have to you look at the business differently, right? And you are so resilient, you're so hard that you then think about creative ideas. And, mm. and, and I think that's really important. Yeah, and I do think it's true to say that like on that specific example with like funding, there is a reason why so many of the businesses that are literally given like a hundred million on an idea end up failing because yeah. they spend so badly and yeah. they like pursue such like the ideas, you know, you don't need to be frugal. Mm. Like we are so productive with our spend now because our budgets are like everyone who joins the company is like, oh my God. And it's like, yeah, well, our margins aren't where a normal fashion business is because mm. we do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And like that's that's what's made us like be how we are and be like creative and like all of those different things. Yeah. If you were talking to the you at the beginning of 2023. Oh my God, this time last year, not good. What would you say to her? Oh gosh, you'll get back in your jeans. <laughs> Don't you worry. Don't throw them away. But like, 
more is in a like you'll get back in yourself, I guess. I like it. Yeah. Metaphorical and <laughs> realistic. <laughs> I'm still not back in the jeans, but I feel back in the jeans as in like, I feel, I definitely feel more myself. And I keep, at Christmas, I was like, I kept saying to Ronnie, he's like, this is my husband. And he's like, stop going on about it. But I was like, do you remember this time last year? And I was really sad. And then we walked around. And I was just like crying all the time. And he's like, yeah, because it was really hard for me as well. And, and you forget that yeah. it was really hard for everybody around me as well. I was a, honestly probably a very difficult person to be around because I just didn't feel like myself. So, mm -hmm. um, but then when John says that to me, I'm like, well, imagine how I felt in my body, <laughs> not knowing myself. And then he's like, how have you made this? How have you flipped this around? I'm like, I'm not sure, but it's working, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, this time last year was really, um, I felt, I, I feel like a completely different person. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Well, and that's on growth and that's on different seasons mm. of life and learning. And as you said, like so much this year has yeah. been, like you do get those learnings out of the tough times, but also it'd be nice not to have them so intensely mm. I'm sure and what are you most looking forward to for this year um this sounds so cheesy but everything I like I love life I get so excited I love meeting people I love doing things like this I love going on holidays and feeling inspired seeing I don't know a piece of fabric that I'm like oh my god let's like can I do a rug collaboration and do this yeah I just I, I I'm really excited about everything but I'm also excited about being more thoughtful and um, not thinking about things in the short term as in a 12 or a, a mm. two years, but thinking about things longer term than that and not in a, um, in a, in a materialistic way with tangible things, but how do I build a lasting business? How do I create friendships that are meaningful? How do I create meaningful relationships um, and not be just thinking about just the tomorrow but thinking about yeah things um with a bit more kind of legacy and substance to them mm. and I think that is a perfect place to end and we will all be going for a life well uh. lived I feel like that's such a good saying and like motto to live by I feel like because it ties into so many different things as well mm. like it's a different thing every day and yeah. sometimes it is about work and Sometimes it's about life and family mm -hmm. and like all of these different things. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. You've been great.